Welcome, welcome to our continuing discussion of types of structural action. We've been talking about axial compression or members that have forces along the length of the members, which are tending to crush the members. So far we've talked about uh, a variety of uh, general issues. The fact that compression elements can fail by yielding the material or by elastic instability, wherein the overall structure is somehow not formulated in a way that it can keep itself stable, so the stress never even reaches the yield point of the material before the structure begins to uh, change shape abruptly. Elastic instability will be a limiting factor in most of the compression members that you will ever incorporate into any structures that you design. Again, I remind you, elastic instability is abrupt it's sudden, it is not self-limiting, it is not the same as bending, it's called buckling. Buckling is a shorthand term and it should never be confused with bending. Uh, buckling, as we've mentioned already, can severely limit the strength of members that are working in compression, uh, particularly if they're not well designed. So we've been talking about ways of bracing compression members so that they are able to take higher loads without buckling. In the last uh, video, we talked about using triangulation as a way of bracing. Now we want to talk about how we can use rigid joints uh, to provide bracing. So rigid joint column bracing is the topic, and sometimes these columns are called Virendil columns or Virendil truss columns after the name of a person who did some research on them and use the term truss frequently because he was trying to promote their value. They're not fully triangulated trusses. They're not trusses in the, in the sense in which we normally use the term, but that terminology has been used uh, at some points in the literature. All right, so here we have a couple of vertical elements and they're so pathetic and weak and floppy that they're kind of leaning up against each other and they're really not capable of taking any load. The interesting thing is that if we glue a cross member across the top and we give a rigid joint here so that the vertical elements now you'll notice are pulled back to vertical at that point. So they come here, they come out vertical, they start to keel over and then up at the top this member pulls them back to vertical. And when that happens, we're able, the structure is actually able to carry some load up here. It's not much load, and this photograph was actually taken while the thing was just beginning to keel over to the side. So we're observing buckling failure. We're seeing a classic uh, half sine curve. So here's a peak, and we come down and we get to a trough. Um, and so the effective overall length of this column is from there to there. Now we can come along and add another uh, horizontal element that's glued. So we bring them back to vertical here and there and up here and down there and so forth. Uh, so they're roughly vertical at all these locations. The craftsmanship on this project, by the way, was not particularly good and the glue tended to melt the plastic and then the plastic would be a bit deformed afterwards. On the other hand, this, this uh, experiment was astoundingly accurate in predicting results because the load we had here is about one quarter of the load that we could carry there and that's exactly what the theory predicts is going to be the case and now we should be able to carry four times more if we come along with additional bracing elements and that turns out to be the case it's a little hard to see here because these are these big black weights but basically in going from there to there we have quadrupled the load. So this, this idea of we don't actually have to be fully triangulated, we can allow the structure to keel over to the side, but we do help ourselves tremendously if we introduce these elements that pull the verticals back up to vertical periodically. So here's another little model that shows the same kind of effect. Here we've got some pieces of aluminum that have some fairly tight holes and these pieces of PVC plastic rod come in. So they're coming out essentially vertical at the base right here. 
and they're going in essentially vertical at the top. I'm not doing a very good job of drawing it, but in the in in the interim portion, they're they're keeling over quite a bit to the side. Now, um, this is you can imagine stacking a whole bunch of these on top of each other, and that is effectively what this Virendio column or this rigid joint column is doing. And some of our students in our uh, review space in Brooks Hall uh, decided to demonstrate this point. I still don't know who the students were who did this, but I got called in by Jim Raines, who was so impressed with it. And I was pretty impressed with it also. Um, I hope these are students who took my class, but whoever they are, uh, they showed a good intuitive understanding of how this works. So in essence, uh, one of the ways you can think of it is, this is a flagpole, that's a table leg. This is a flagpole and a table leg. And the key thing is those things have to be connected to this inter intermediate element with rigid joints or moment joints. Those are two similar terms. Uh, this is more of a kind of architectural application of that principle. Here we have a vertical element and it's welded to this nice thick horizontal and another thick horizontal up there. And you'll notice something that's been done actually is uh, the moment connection has been expressed by continuing the web through here. This is done by cutting pieces and using full penetration welding. So the actual beam stops right there, but some pieces of steel plate get welded in here and with full penetration weld, it's actually difficult to tell whether the horizontal or the vertical is what was continuous originally. <clears throat> so this structure is a very stable structure by virtue of these rigid joints or moment connections. Here's another example. We have some fairly deep plates which have gotten welded into these verticals and they are helping to stabilize those verticals and making them work pretty effectively. If we just had one of these verticals coming up out of the ground, it would literally wave back and forth in the wind and would be a very poor column. But because it's braced periodically with these moment joints, it's working really well. Here's another example. You'll notice these elements are braced periodically by moment connections to these horizontal elements. Here's a structure that most of you are familiar with. Here we have horizontal elements, which are nice and deep. They are framing into these vertical elements and creating this uh, rigid frame column, which the rigid frame is what's keeping it from uh, keeling over from left to right or from side to side. The tops of these columns are actually stabilized to some degree by these tension elements coming out on each side. So we don't need to rigid frame it uh, relative to movement parallel to this line connecting the two tops. We don't need bracing in that direction, but we do need bracing relative to forces in these directions. You'll notice, by the way, it's rigid frame up above, but down below it's fully triangulated, and that's because there is a bunch of wind load that's creating force in this direction. Um, and that full triangulation down below is more efficient. Generally, full triangulation is more efficient uh, structurally than rigid joints. But sometimes rigid joints can be quite beautiful. People really love the Golden Gate Bridge. And I think one of the reasons they love it is the nature of this portal which feels very tall and very open and inviting for the traffic to go through it. Um, this is the Sears Tower. You'll notice that again we have this pattern that these members have been welded to those members and then these webs have been stiffened and reinforced. And when you get through with full penetration welds, you don't know whether those flanges or these flanges were the ones that were continuous originally. This entire building is stabilized by these rigid joints. Uh, there are nine tubes and all the faces of these nine tubes have these kind of rigid joint uh, connections. Um, and that's the only source of stabilization. There is no triangulation and no shear walls in this building.
Here's a more local example which does something similar. These tall vertical columns are actually braced because they're attached to the top cord and the bottom cord of these trusses and the trusses hold them vertical at that point. There is no cross bracing and no shear walls in this building either. So they're really open spaces on the interior. Now, this shows a bunch of different kinds of column configurations. If we have a rigid joint at the bottom, but we allow sway, we get a deformation like that, which we sometimes refer to as a flagpole. Uh, if we have a moment connection at the top, but a pin joint at the bottom, uh, we call this a table leg. And of course, that's a very common configuration where there's a moment connection of the leg at the tabletop, but just a fairly minimal leg at the bottom and no attempt to create a moment joint. This is a shape we looked at earlier where there's a moment connection at the bottom and at the top, but whatever this top is, it's allowed to sway laterally. So we get a deformation that looks something like that. This is our classic pin pin. So there's some kind of structure that keeps the top from moving, but it can, the column can rotate and rotate here. Um, and this is one of our most common kinds of columns. And the situation we've talked about is uh, a big box uh, store where um, there are tall, slender columns and uh, there's no real good way to do a moment connection at the top. And it's difficult enough at the bottom that we don't bother. So, uh, for example, let's go look at uh, this kind of flagpole configuration. This is the classic base. In this particular column, this uh, wall material of the column is about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. It's really quite thin. It's less than a quarter of an inch. This base, though, is more than an inch and a half. And the reason is that the base is undergoing bending, but there are wells that create stress concentration there. So the, the base plate is much thicker. But off in the distance, you see one of these elements there's nothing to brace it laterally, so uh, it can sway. Uh, if it was trying to buckle, it would sway. If it gets wind load on it, it sways. So there's this super massive uh, moment connection at the base. Uh, you can do that in architecture. Uh, this is a beautiful building that was designed by Pierre Luigi Nervi. These are literally tree structures or flagpoles. You'll notice how wide they are at the base and they had to be super wide and super massive in the case of this building because there is no connection between these elements. There's just some glass up there. And so each one of these things is like an individual tree and under wind load it can move. So in order to avoid breaking that glass, these trees had to be super rigid. Most trees tend to flex and use that as a method of shedding wind load. So we don't do a whole lot of tree structures like this because to get the level of rigidity that we normally want in a building, uh, this is just not a good geometry to use. But Nervi pulled it off on this structure and did a very elegant job of it. So when you're inside this structure, you see these seams of light, which is really quite dramatic because you walk through it and you have the very clear sense of the independence of each of these uh, columns. Okay, so we can look at a table leg column where we have a pin joint at the bottom, some kind of moment connection to some kind of rigid structure up above. So that might look something like this. We have some interesting historical examples. This is the uh, a building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. This is Johnson Wax building. You'll notice how thin it is at the base that it flares out at the top. And up above these columns, there are deep, there's a deep grid of beams going this way and then, then connecting the columns in that direction. So every column is moment connected to two beams up above and those two beams are perpendicular to each other. So this is the classic example of the table leg structure. This is another view of it. And to obscure those beams, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright actually dropped down this uh, ceiling, a luminescent ceiling. So the only part of the beam you see is this portion right here, but actually up above the beam is much deeper and it runs all the way across and connects to the top of that column and the top of this column 
to stabilize those columns. Frank Lloyd Wright actually put out this drawing which didn't show those beams up above and there was an engineer who saw it and became convinced that Frank Lloyd Wright was insane and that he was going to kill a lot of people in this building uh, but in fact uh, it was very well thought out. A lot of things Frank Lloyd Wright, by the way, did were not very well thought out structurally and were pretty catastrophic. He's got a lot of buildings out there that were pretty junky, but this one managed to work pretty well. Okay, here's another example. This is, uh, again, Pierre Luigi Nervi in his Pirelli building in Italy. You'll notice it's thin near the bottom, gets very wide near the top. So we have these nice, big, chunky, rigid frame connections that are helping to stabilize this building. Here's a more common example. Here we have a moment connection to this table leg. So relative to forces parallel to this beam, um, this is a table leg. Relative to forces parallel to these members, uh, it's actually a pin-pin column. And in fact, the pin-pin column is stabilized by the cross bracing in that bay. So if I asked you, is this a table leg or a pin-pin column, you would have to say, well, relative to which direction of buckling are you talking about? Or you, you could say, it's both. It's pin-pinned relative to buckling in one direction and table leg relative to buckling in another direction. This is the base of it, which is pretty narrow, and we call it a pin joint because when we look at that joint and its width, compared to this joint, this is by far the stiffest joint. And in fact, down here, we've only got one bolt, which is the classic way to not do a rigid joint or not do a moment connection. Uh, this shows the base of that. And uh, you'll notice that uh, single bolt on each side. Whoa. Um, <clears throat> we can also end up with a situation like this where there is no tilt and no sway at the top. So you'll notice this column is coming out vertical and it's also not moving from side to side. So in the case of the table leg, we had lateral movement. Uh, we also had it here where here we just have a pin joint at the bottom. Here we have a moment joint or a rigid joint at the bottom and at the top, but we still have uh, lateral sway here. Um, we can restrain movement at the top and also have rigid connections. So this is like a super braced column, which can't have sway and will not have tilt either. And here is a classic example of how that's done. We've already talked about this example that this triangulation is preventing sway for all these joints in the structure. You'll also notice that those joints are moment joints. So now, uh, before we said, well, so we could have actually movement like this, but uh, that's actually not what happens. It remains vertical here, and then bows out and comes back to vertical and then it comes down and it could uh, go either left or right so down here it might go that way but basically we're saying it has a geometry like this where there's no lateral movement at this point due to the cross bracing which is preventing uh, sway and likewise we have horizontal members framing into those joints which are uh, keeping the members vertical at those points so this is not the actual bracing pattern. It's something more like what's rendered here. So uh, this is a combination of both rigid joint and triangulation. And by the way, this triangulation, we, oh, I should say we may have this kind of action in this building also. We talked about the fact that these members stabilize that joint, that joint comes over to stabilize that one. This member goes up here. We may have, in every one of these floors, you'll notice they're fairly deep, we may have moment connections also occurring. So not only do we have lateral bracing of that point and that point and that point, but in between we may have moment joints 
uh, connecting these verticals to the floor. So there are a lot of different options that can be used to create uh, super braced column elements and these are just some of the ones that we've looked at. So that ends our discussion of axial compression. This is our, our third installment or our third video dealing with axial compression members and in this one we've been discussing the effect of rigid joints embracing the compression member against lateral buckling.